I'm gonna start this review by saying that I am not a photographer and I've never claimed to be, but that said, I think that if you are someone that not only films weddings, but also photographs them, the Sony a7R5 is arguably the most compelling option for a hybrid when it comes to cameras from Sony or pretty much any other company for that matter. It offers many of the same features of the flagship Sony A1, but in a body that manages to do new tricks while also costing thousands of dollars less. So if you are looking for a camera that can take great photos and then with a flick of the switch, turn into an 8K shooting monster, you gotta check out the a7R5. Hey, by the way, I'm Matt Johnson, and in this video, I'm gonna be reviewing the a7R5 from the perspective of a wedding filmmaker and telling you if it's a good camera for you to purchase if you film weddings or other documentary events. And in addition, considering that this is a camera that has traditionally been aimed at photographers, I will also be considering wedding photography in this review. So regardless of whether you are a filmmaker or a photographer, please keep watching. Before we get started though, for the sake of ethics, I want you to know that this video isn't paid or sponsored by Sony, and while they did loan me this camera for review, it has to go back to them very soon, and the first time they see this video is the first time you see it when I upload it to YouTube. Now, in the past, Sony has done a really good job of segmenting their product lines. You had the A7S series, which was targeted solely at filmmakers with a much smaller megapixel sensor, and this camera was purpose-built for filmmaking. Then you had the A7R series that was aimed at capturing the market of all of the pro photographers that needed a high megapixel camera. And I personally know many wedding photographers that love and use the A7R camera line. Lastly, you had the A7 series that didn't have a letter after it. This was as close as Sony got to offering a hybrid of both photo and video in that this camera combined a relatively high megapixel sensor with some of the video features. But while it was a jack of all trades, it really was a master of none. Sony wanted you to specialize. They wanted you to choose a specific camera that you would use, and maybe, if they got lucky, you'd buy both the S and the R line of cameras. You can comment down below if you've ever bought both of them. But lately, things have been changing. In 2019, Sony released the A7R4, and this is one half of the last cameras that I would consider to be in that old system, where Sony wanted you to either buy a photo or a video camera. I still remember Sony's press conference for the R4 vividly because I wanted it to be the A7S III so bad. And whenever they got on stage and said, look at it, it's the R4. It has the exact same 8-bit video capabilities as our previous cameras. I died a little bit inside. Thankfully, the next year, Sony released the A7S III and I was happy again. Both the R4 and S3 were solely focused on photo and video, but now things are starting to change. We're seeing competitors like Canon introduce cameras that have both amazing photo and video features combined, like in the R5. I mean, aside from that whole overheating thing, you can watch my test for that camera in the corner and down in the video description. Anyways, Sony had to compete. And finally, with the A1, they released a camera that was a true hybrid, capable of both amazing 50.1 megapixel stills and amazing video all the way up to 8K resolution. The issue is that the A1 was really meant to be a Halo product, the ultimate camera that Sony crammed all of their latest technology into. The con is that, like all Halo cameras, this was incredibly expensive, coming in at over $6,000. Don't get me wrong, I'm really happy that Sony started combining photo and video capabilities into one camera, but it came at quite the cost. Thankfully, the A1 was a portent of things to come because just a few months ago, Sony announced the R5. Sony's version of the R5, not Canon's R5. The naming systems are way too similar. The point is that we are finally seeing a closer merger of photo and video capabilities for a better price with even less compromises than the A1. So let's talk about the R5's video and a bit about its photo capabilities. Starting off with the body and build quality, this camera shares a ton with the A7 IV. The buttons are all the same and in the same locations, which I have zero complaints about, 
But whenever you switch to the back of the camera, the screen is where you notice the big difference. See, for years, Sony used a vertical articulating screen, and it's something that I really liked as a filmmaker because I could hold my camera at chest level, tilt up the screen, and be able to look down and see what I was filming. Unfortunately though, the screen could not flip around and let me see myself while I was filming, which is a big pain as someone that films himself fairly often. Sony then attempted to fix this issue with their APS-C A6400 and A6600 cameras that included a screen that could flip completely upward and allow you to see yourself above the camera. Of course, this made for issues if you had a microphone that you were using and wasn't ideal. Thankfully, soon afterward, they announced the ZV-1 that included an articulating screen and flipped out to the side, like pretty much all of their competition, and they soon began including flip outside screens on all of their newer cameras. It's been great, but the problem is that a lot of filmmakers, and especially photographers, preferred the old tilting screen from their older cameras. And while it wasn't a huge deal to flip your screen out and then tilt it up, it still significantly increased the overall footprint of the camera, and I'm sure there were some Sony engineers wishing that they could create something that was the best of both worlds. Thankfully, they didn't have to look far for ideas because Panasonic, and I'm sure other camera companies, but Panasonic is the one that comes to mind right now, released the S1H several years ago, and that camera included a screen that had the ability to not only flip outward to the side, but also tilt up and down vertically. Revolutionary. There was also a mega thick screen too. Heck, the entire camera was thick. If you ever used one, you know what I'm talking about. Beautiful footage, but wow, that was a thick boy. Anyways, I'm happy to say that with the a7R5, Sony has now included a screen that is not only capable of flipping outward, but also tilting up and down as well, giving both filmmakers and photographers the best of both worlds where they can tilt or move the screen whichever direction they want and thereby get amazing footage and photos from any angle. The screen is really just fun to play with too, because while it does look thin, it's very solidly built and it doesn't feel flimsy at all. And it's pretty fun to contort in various ways. So if you are a wedding filmmaker or photographer and you commonly find yourself needing to get some weird angles or positions to get a creative shot, the a7R5 has my new favorite screen on any Sony camera. And once you use it, you're going to wish that Sony included the screen on every single one of their cameras. And honestly, hopefully they will moving forward. Also, side note, this screen is also a huge argument for why I would consider purchasing the a7R5 over the A1, as having used the A1 and felt rather limited by its lack of flip around screen, the R5 screen is dramatically better. Back to the body now. Other than the screen, the a7R5 packs pretty much all the other features that you expect from a brand new Sony camera. So you get a full size HDMI port that supports external raw recording, micro USB, as well as USB-C ports that support fast charging and allow you to use the camera as a very expensive webcam, a mic jack, a headphone jack, and a hot shoe mount at the top of the camera that electronically supports Sony's microphones like the ECMB1M. On the other side, you also get dual CF Express and SD card slots that you're going to love. And if you are a wedding photographer or filmmaker, I would always recommend using dual cards when recording because in the event that one of the cards fails, you will have a backup. And considering that weddings are one take events where you do not get any do-overs, any redundancy that you can build into your camera is always a great idea. Now there is one thing that you will not notice on the a7R5 in that there are no slots for a fan here on the back of the camera. This isn't surprising considering this is a hybrid photo and video camera, unlike the FX30 or FX3, for example, but touching on overheating here for a second, Sony says that they put the same heat dissipation technology that they designed for the a7S III into this camera, meaning that it should still be able to record for quite a long time before you deal with any overheating. Of course, keep in mind that this camera is capable of recording in 8K resolution, and any time you start filming at very high resolution like that, you are basically asking for overheating at some point. So if you are filming a wedding ceremony outdoors in the summer, maybe don't film that ceremony in 8K if you don't want a sad surprise when the ceremony is done. Looking inward to the camera's menus now, one nice feature that Sony took from the a7 IV is the addition of the photo and video mode dial switches at the top of the camera, which will be especially useful to you if you are a hybrid shooter that needs to film and take photographs at the same time. Because whenever you change this switch, it's going to change all of the menu structures for the camera to be more photo or video oriented, depending on which mode you are in. 
Like other new Sony cameras too, you can also customize the buttons and function menu of the camera to different settings, depending on whether you were in photo or video mode, which will help you make very quick setting changes. In addition, talking about the software functionality of the a7R5, Sony has put all of their newer software features in this camera. So you're getting things like focus breathing compensation that is mind blowing and eliminates focus breathing with Sony's native lenses, the focus map feature that gives you a colored overlay and shows you what's in focus, which is great for manual focusing, variable shutter control, which helps you remove flicker if you're dealing with really cheap lights that are flickering badly. These settings are all great, but they're also a bit controversial right now because Sony hasn't updated their older cameras with these features via a firmware update, meaning that in terms of software features, the a7R5 costs thousands of dollars less than the A1, but it also has more features which could be added to the A1 with a firmware update. It's a big pain and I would love to see Sony update their camera's software. Anyways, this camera has a lot more advancements that we need to talk about. And some of them are revolutionary, but others are more evolutionary. For photographers, I feel like the R5 is a bit more of an evolution than a revolution. From a photo standpoint, you are still getting a 61 megapixel sensor that is similar to the one that was present in the a7R4. That said though, when Sony released the R4, it felt a bit ahead of its time. It felt like Sony was really pushing the processor of that camera to be even capable of handling that many megapixels. Now that it's been a few years though, the underlying technology to handle and process those 61 megapixel images is greatly improved. You can now take up to 583 compressed raw photos at 10 frames per second before filling up the buffer of this camera, which is awesome. There's also a new higher resolution viewfinder that's 9.4 million dots up from 5.7 million on the R4. These features are evolutionary. But hold up, because the autofocus on the other hand is definitely revolutionary for both photo and video. I'm so excited to tell you that we are finally seeing larger camera companies copy Apple and Google and begin using things like deep learning and artificial intelligence to dramatically improve the performance of their cameras. In Sony's case, they use deep learning to dramatically improve the quality of their autofocus systems in the a7R5. It is still using phase detect autofocus points that are across the entire sensor, but these autofocus points are now much smarter. Thanks to a new AI processing unit chip in the R5, in both photo and video mode, the camera can now recognize human, animal, and bird eyes for autofocus. And even more, it can also recognize cars, trains, planes, and insects. So pretty much regardless of what you are filming, this camera is going to be capable of focusing on pretty much anything faster and more accurately. But there's more, and this is gonna be really exciting for you if you're a wedding filmmaker or photographer, because one of the biggest benefits of this AI chip is the addition of what Sony calls human pose estimation. Basically what this means is that the camera can now not only look for faces and eyes, but it can also look for human bodies and it can tell where the human arms, legs, and torso are. Now why should you care about this? Unless you want the autofocus for taking feet pics, which, hey, that's a different business to be clear, but very lucrative, I hear. It's just what I hear, no judgment. Feed picks aside though, the reason the camera being able to see limbs and torsos is so important is that it enables the camera to be able to tell where a person's face is without them even looking at the camera. In the past with older Sony cameras, if the person you were filming was not facing your lens, the camera had no clue what to focus on. But now that the camera can look and recognize the human body, it can then say, well, here's the feet and here's the torso, which means the head must be right above it, meaning that's where I'm gonna choose to focus right here where the face is. So whenever this person does turn around, they're gonna be perfectly in focus. For me as a wedding filmmaker and for you as either a wedding filmmaker or photographer, think about the dance floor. You're always trying to get great shots of the dance floor, but there are 50 50 or 100 faces that your camera could be confused about what do you want to focus on. And in reality, you're wanting the camera to be focused on the couple that's right in front of you. But the bride's currently being twirled around by the groom, so it's really hard for the camera to maintain focus, or at least it was, because now the camera can recognize the bride's torso, estimate where her face is from that, and keep her in focus. It's super cool, and I can't wait for this to be in every single Sony camera moving forward. And I also want them to incorporate more artificial intelligence and machine learning into their cameras, because let's be honest, iPhones and Google Pixels are kind of 
eating major camera manufacturers lunch whenever it comes to using AI to dramatically enhance photo and video. And I want that capability in my bigger cameras. Can you imagine something like the cinematic mode on the iPhone that blurs out the background, which you would normally not need on a full frame camera like the A7R5 because it has a large sensor and you can put a high wide aperture lens on it. But imagine that you could only afford cheaper F4 lenses but then you could turn this artificial intelligence cinematic bokeh mode on to essentially turn that F4 lens into an F1.4 lens with artificial bokeh. That could be cool. Dream with me, it's beautiful. Anyways, coming back to the R5, we have more to talk about. Sticking on this revolutionary trend, we need to talk about IBIS. No, not irritable bowel syndrome. I've made that joke before, but I'm a dad, it's still funny to me. IBIS, AKA in-body image stabilization. Sony mirrorless cameras ever since the A7R2 and A7S2 has had this capability. And when Sony released the A7S3, this feature was even more improved with the addition of active in-body image stabilization, which made the footage even smoother by cropping in on the sensor 1.1 times. Now, even with active image stabilization, Panasonic filmmakers will tell you that Sony's cameras have fallen far behind Panasonic's when it comes to IBIS performance, with the general retort being, well, how's that? I don't focus treating you. And we're not going to start a war here. Please don't start a war in the comments. My point is that with the a7R5, it feels like Sony is finally starting to catch up. Sony claims that this camera right now includes up to eight stops of in-body image stabilization. And whenever I tested this on the streets of New York City, I found that it was substantially improved over previous Sony cameras, especially considering that I was not using a lens with optical image stabilization. Alternatively though, if you're a wedding photographer, imagine being able to take even longer exposure photos handheld. It's pretty great. Speaking of photography, another little update that doesn't really relate to IBIS, but it's something that I think is really cool for this camera is that Sony has removed the bulb timer limit, which if you've ever used previous Sony cameras and you wanted to take a long exposure photo, you will know that you were limited to 30 seconds that you could keep the shutter open unless you choose to use an external intervalometer to hold the shutter open longer. This all changed with the A7R5 though, because the bulb timer limit has been increased from 30 seconds all the way up to 15 minutes which effectively gets rid of your need to use an external intervalometer, which is great. Back to the features now. What else do we got? Oh yeah, battery life. In my testing, I found the A7R5 battery life to be very comparable to Sony's other new cameras that use the NP-FZ100 batteries. So I would expect to go through three to four on a wedding day if you're filming a wedding. And if you're photographing a wedding, I would expect to go through the same amount of batteries that you normally would with a Sony camera. Sorry, haven't photographed a wedding with this camera. Photography, what's that? I am trying, okay? We're making this review here. Also, uh, sorry photographers, again, uh, we need to talk about the video features here for a bit because as I said at the start of this review, the A7R5 is a camera where we're really starting to see Sony combining some of their best video features with their best photo features. So photographers, you can just tune out, I guess, or pay attention and just get into video. Join us, join us on the video side. With the A7R4, you weren't really getting these video capabilities, so it's so great to see them now in the A7R5. So just like Sony's other new mirrorless cameras, you get the exact same picture profiles and bit rates, meaning the R5 can record in XAVCS, XAVCHS, and XAVCSI, and XAVCHS in particular can record in 8K at 24 frames per second. All of these formats record in gorgeous 10-bit color. Plus, you can also use all the picture profiles that you would expect from newer Sony cameras like S-Log3 and S-Cinetone, so you can easily match this camera with other Sony cameras. Unfortunately, the A7R5 doesn't fall under the umbrella of cinema camera, which means that it does not include Cine EI mode or the custom LUTs feature that you would see on the FX30 or FX3, but we can dream that they would include it in a future firmware update, right? I've got a lot of dreams for firmware updates here. A lot of dreams. Side note, all the A7R5 footage that you're seeing in this video, as well as any of the other footage that you're seeing, has all been colored with my color presets, Who is Matt Lutz, which work great with the footage from all cameras, including Sony cameras like the A7R5. So if you want great colors, I'll link to my color presets down below. Now, let's talk frame rates and resolution. As I said, the headlining feature of the A7R5 is that it's capable of filming in 8K at 24 frames per second in 
roughly full frame. More on that in just a second. This footage, of course, looks gorgeous, but I will warn you that it does unsurprisingly have compromises like significant rolling shutter. So be careful if you're filming handheld. And here it is. 8K also comes with a 1.2 times crop of the sensor, which isn't major, but keep in mind that it is a bit of a loss of width. Importantly, 8K also disables the active image stabilization mode because that would crop in even more and the camera would lose too much resolution for 8K and you need all those megapixels for 8K. So there are definitely some compromises. One cool thing though, is that you only need a V60 speed SD card to film in 8K. So if you have one of those laying around, congratulations. You don't need to buy CF Express type A for 8K. Just use an SD card. Now, in addition to 8K, you also get a lot more frame rates to choose from, including 4K at up to 60 FPS. Just like 8K, this 4K 60 crops in 1.2 times, but unlike 8K, you can use active image stabilization mode, which is a win. Likewise, you can also film in 4K at 24 and 30 frames per second. And as a big plus, neither of these frame rates have a crop. So you're getting those 0.2 back, bring it back full frame again. That said though, one last note about 4K 24 through 4K 60 frame rates. All of these frame rates use pixel binning, which means they're not gonna be quite as high of quality as they would be if the camera was oversampling the image down to 4K. But that said, they still look good. Sony's using a good algorithm for their downsizing here. I would just be aware of this if you wanna do some pixel peeping. Lastly, in regards to frame rates, the a7R5 does offer a super 35 millimeter crop mode as well for 4K at 24 and 30 FPS, which will crop in on the sensor 1.5 times and essentially turn it into an APS-C camera. This probably doesn't really sound like a good thing, but one benefit of this mode is that if you use it, the camera will not pixel bin the footage and it will actually oversample it from 6.2K resolution, which should give you a nice boost in sharpness. That Super for 35 crop mode does work in photo mode too, which will help if you want to crop in camera. And speaking of cropping in camera, if you're filming a wedding ceremony, you want to crop in, just use the Super 35 mode. We'll zoom in there, pretty fancy. So with all of these filmmaking settings, there are some compromises, but Overall, you're still getting a camera that is capable of recording 8K at 24 FPS and 4K at 60 FPS, which sounds pretty good to me. Do I wish there was a 4K 120 FPS option also? Of course, but that's where Sony wants you to buy the A1. Now let's talk about the low light performance of the a7R5. When I had the opportunity to use this camera for a day in New York City, I took the chance to do a low light test, which if you want to see the full test, I'll link to it up here in the corner and down in the video description, but here are the highlights. Just like many of Sony's newer cameras, the a7R5 looks to have a dual native ISO, where it has two ISO levels where the camera looks its best with the least amount of noise. When you're filming an S-Log3, these two ISO levels are ISO 800 and ISO 2500. Otherwise though, as you start to increase the ISO higher, you are going to notice more noise start to appear in your image. But even whenever I went to ISO 12800, I still found it to be quite usable. And if you needed to push the camera higher all the way up to ISO 32000, I think you totally could at a wedding. By all means, please bring lights to a wedding or if you're a photographer use your flash but this is really impressive low light performance for a camera with such a high megapixel sensor and I think it offers a lot of versatility for a wedding filmmaker or photographer regardless of the lighting scenario you find yourself in. Save for needing to film outside under a full moon where the that's the only light that you're getting in which case I would recommend filming with the a7s3 or fx3 I think you're going to be fine with the a7r5. Next, let's talk about the price of the a7R5 because I think Sony has really positioned the cost of this camera well. At the time of making this video, the R5 costs $3,900, which is a fantastic value, especially whenever you compare it to their flagship camera, the A1, which comes in at $6,500 at the time of making this video. In addition, if you consider that the predecessor to this camera, the a7R4, cost only $400 less when it came out, a $400 price increase for the a7R5 doesn't sound so bad. But should you buy one? If you have the budget and you're considering buying the A1, I would pause and take a very close look at the A7R5. Because aside from some of the more niche high-end features that the A1 offers, like faster photo frame rates per second and video features like 4K at 120fps, the A7R5 competes with it very well and honestly surpasses it in many ways. You still get to film in 8K, but you get to do it in a better body that includes a dramatically improved screen that can flip around as well as tilt. You also get much better in-body image stabilization and stunning autofocus performance that is significantly more accurate and can really help you take significantly more photos and videos that will be usable and properly in focus. So 
Like I said at the start, a lot of the photo features of this camera are evolutionary, especially whenever you consider that you're not getting a megapixel bump, but even so, it feels like this camera with its faster processing is much better able to take advantage of the megapixels it does have. Plus, when you look at it from a video standpoint, this is the first time that Sony has put this level of video capabilities in a camera at this price point. I'll make it simple for you. For the past year, I've recommended that hybrid photographers and filmmakers that need a camera that can do both photo and video should purchase the a7 IV, a camera that offers a lot of great features at a great price, but still has a lot of compromises. Hello, 4K60 crop. With the introduction of the a7R5, yes, you are spending more money, but if you are someone that wants a camera that can perform at an extremely high level for both photo and video, where you could take it out on a Saturday and photograph a wedding and Sunday turn around and film a wedding with the exact same camera, it's a no-brainer to recommend you buy the a7R5. Also, speaking of no-brainers, if you're a wedding filmmaker, I've put together a free guide called Level Up Your Wedding Films, and this guide is gonna show you some of the biggest tips and techniques that I've learned over the years to dramatically improve the quality of your wedding films. These are all practical tips that you can apply pretty much immediately to your business. This guide's completely free, and you can download it at the link down in the video description. I'll also link down below to my color presets. Who is Matt Lutz? They're gonna give you amazing colors for your a7R5 or any other camp for that matter. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.